This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the third video for the Digestive System Unit. In this video, I'm going to be talking about some common digestive system disorders and also then end with the effect of aging on your digestive system. There are many digestive system disorders and diseases that I could talk about, but basically I'm going to just cover a few in three broad categories to kind of highlight the sorts of things that can go wrong. We're going to talk about some of the problems that can be caused by infectious agents. Those are things like bacteria or viruses or even protozoa or other parasites that can come live in your digestive system. I also want to mention some of the congenital disorders, <clears throat> things that come up because of a faulty gene. And then finally, some of the digestive disorders that are more closely tied to your own lifestyle choices. So starting with infectious agents, let's start with something I'm sure everybody is familiar with, gastroenteritis, also known as the stomach bug or the stomach flu, though it really has nothing to do with the flu, that, um, the influenza virus. You may have gastroenteritis because you have a virus or a bacteria attacking you, or you might have picked up a parasite, Giardia, that's present in water, fresh water um, uh, throughout the world is a common parasite that causes gastroenteritis. And so in this condition, you have inflammation of the stomach and intestines, and so you can have vomiting or diarrhea, painful stomach or intestines. Um, foodborne illness is also a type of gastroenteritis. Here you have a bacteria that is being carried by the food. Foodborne illness is most likely a problem with a perishable food that has been held at room temperature for more than two hours something that has been infected with a bacteria, and then basically allowed to incubate in nice warm temperatures uh, up to a point where the exponential of the growth of the bacteria means that every spoonful you take is just brimming with infectious agents that can colonize your small intestine. In general, gastroenteritis begins about 12 to 72 hours after you have taken in the uh, agent, the, you know, you've gotten the bacteria or the virus in your mouth and down into your digestive system, and it generally resolves on its own about after about a week. Sometimes in extreme cases, you will need to have um, various medication to stop diarrhea or to stop vomiting, but in general, most healthy people can manage to overcome these various infectious agents without outside intervention. If you are involved in treating somebody who's experiencing gastroenteritis, your focus should be on rehydration because both vomiting and diarrhea will be taking fluids out of the body. And so it is important to make sure that there is still fluid going back in. Um, a general rule of thumb, I know people tend to drink sports drinks, but you don't have to drink a sports drink to rehydrate. PD Light is a commercial product, but the proportions are in one quart of liquid, two tablespoons of sugar, and a half a teaspoon of salt will replenish the essential um, bit of glucose and the uh, sodium and chloride ions. And that is a um, formula that's used in third world countries where you know, buying an expensive Pedialyte or, or even Gatorade would just be beyond the possibilities, but sugar and salt and water can be put together. Another disease caused by an infectious agent is hepatitis. Hepatitis, of course, is an inflammation of the liver. I think you should be seeing the connection between hepatic portal veins and, you know, the hepatic system of cells, hepatitis. Hepatitis is most commonly caused by a virus, and there are several viruses involved in causing hepatitis, but other organisms uh, taking in various environmental toxins or even an autoimmune situation can also cause your liver to be inflamed. Hepatitis initially presents as flu-like symptoms. I have had hepatitis. We never were able to determine which particular virus got me. Um, they, are, they are named with letters. There's you know, hepatitis A, B, C. Um, and I was tested for several. But yes, it definitely felt like the flu. I felt like I had no energy. I couldn't keep food down. And eventually, um, I, I didn't become jaundiced, but uh, definitely my urine was a dark brown iced tea color, not yellow anymore. It can be self-limiting, which means it will go away, which was my case. But um, even though the initial symptoms are, have gone away, it did take me quite a long time to fully recover, to feel like I got my strength back. It took a couple months. Or people can experience chronic hepatitis, and chronic hepatitis then can go on to lead to cirrhosis or cancer of the liver, so it can just uh, really do a number on your liver.
Hepatitis B vaccine is routinely given in the United States because it is a very common hepatitis vaccine. It is spread by, uh, it's a sexually transmitted disease, so it's spread by the bodily fluids of semen and blood and vaginal secretions. And so this now has become part of our routine vaccination program. And then we've just got some diagrams here on the bottom showing you with an illustration what an inflamed liver might look like. And then finally, onto gastric ulcers. Peptic ulcers is another name for that. And I think you may have run across previously that these are caused actually by a bacteria, Heliocobacter pylori. It's not caused by too much stress. And you can't treat it by drinking milk like you read about in many old stories. But the damage to the mucus-producing cells in the stomach, because colonies of bacteria have set up residence there, then lead to a hole, a lesion in the digestive wall, because the acid, hydrochloric acid, and the pepsin in the stomach begin attacking the cells of the stomach lining. They've lost that mucus layer. So we've got an illustration over here of what your poor stomach might look like if you are experiencing a gastric ulcer. And it can be bad enough to actually perforate the wall and put a hole all the way through it. Multiple antibiotics are necessary for treating this. This uh, bacteria is a, is a tough one, and it takes quite a bit of, of treatment to get rid of it, but it is possible to treat somebody with an ulcer and see the success of getting rid of the bacterial infection and, and clearing up the ulcer. The non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs which is what aspirin and ibuprofen fall into that category, things that people take because it'll help reduce inflammation in their body. These NSAIDs, or non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, also can irritate the stomach lining and cause ulcers not by um, bacteria colonization, colonization, but just by chronic inflammation. And so it's a, a wise idea not to um, constantly be taking these drugs, if it's at all possible, to, to have a very, you know, as low a dosage as possible to treat inflammation of these particular types of drugs. Now I want to move on to congenital disorders. And again, I'm just touching some highlights of, of dis disorders and diseases because there's many more we could talk about. But the first one in congenital disorders I want to talk about are things known as inborn errors of metabolism, or also called congenital metabolic disorders. And in this case, you have a gene that is faulty. A gene defect leads to a missing enzyme because, of course, genes code for proteins and enzymes are proteins. And as a result, toxic compounds, which would be broken down by that enzyme, may build up or an enzyme that may have be missing is one that would make an essential molecule, and so you cannot make that essential molecule. So in either case, I think you probably can imagine what might happen to someone if toxic compounds that are not supposed to be there are building up in your body, or if something that is supposed to be there, an essential molecule, is not able to be made. There are a lot of inborn errors of metabolism disorders. Uh, it's estimated that in one in every 1,400 births has some type of this um, congenital metabolic disorder, but they vary greatly in their severity so that it, you, know, you might have a very small effect on something um, that can be very easily taken care of and you might not even notice that you have a problem because of, of compensating pr processes in the bottom body, I mean, or it may be something so severe that um, it cannot be treated. Typically, dietary restrictions, enzyme replacement, gene therapy is something that's fairly new that we're trying to find ways to make that work, and even organ transplants may all be used to treat one of these inborn error of metabolism. I'm just going to highlight three of these for you today. The first one is PKU, or phenylketonuria which is an autosomal recessive disorder, so parents have to be carriers in order for it to show up in their children. And the issue here is it's lacking the enzyme that will metabolize excess phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. It is part of the proteins in our body, but we take in typically more than we need, and so we have to have this enzyme to break it down and, and you know, get it ready for um, absorption and reformulation into something else or excreted from the body. Children with PKU cannot metabolize excess phenylalanine, and so it builds up and can lead to um, irreversible neurological damage. And so down here, this is the classic picture that you always see for PKU. Two siblings, one child is affected, the other one is not. If a person is diagnosed at birth, and this is a routine part of newborn testing now, there, there's a heel stick that is done 
A little bit of blood is taken out of the heel of a newborn baby, and they're tested for PKU immediately because phenylalanine is an amino acid. It'll be present in breast milk. They need to know if this is going to be an issue with this child. And if a person does test positive to PKU, then they need to follow a special low-protein diet for the rest of their life with a supplemental formula that will bring in the protein in the amount that they need. And so they follow it, they, you know, they eat fruits and vegetables and things without a lot of protein, so they still can partake in food, in you know, eating food around the table with friends, but they don't eat any protein foods. They only get their protein from the specially supplemented formula, which will not contain too much phenylalanine. So the goal is with this dietary restriction is to avoid putting too much phenylalanine into the body so there's no chance of any excess building up. But this is a fully treatable disease as long as it's caught at birth, and so children you know, are able to maintain growth and their full intellectual capacity um, as long as they follow the dietary restrictions. Another inborn error of metabolism that unfortunately we cannot treat at the moment is Tay-Sachs disease. <clears throat> Tay-Sachs is also an autosomal recessive disorder, so parents may not know that they are carriers until they have a child born with Tay-Sachs. It is known as a lysosomal storage disease, that it is missing an enzyme in the lysosome, and so um, things that should be broken down cannot be broken down, and they just hang out in the cells. And specifically with Tay-Sachs disease, a particular lipid hangs out in the cells in the brain and basically um, squashes the neurons. As this lipid, this fat, continues to build up over time, the brain cells get squeezed and will eventually die. It is a progressive disease with no known treatment. Children typically develop signs of Tay-Sachs at about six months of age, and then um, it slowly progresses, becomes worse and worse until the child dies, usually between their third and fourth birthday. There are several population groups that are much more likely to have Tay-Sachs, but it can occur spontaneously. Um, in fact, a book that I read about gene therapy mentioned a family in Columbia, South Carolina, who had Tay-Sachs arise in a child absolutely spontaneously. So this little diagram over here shows basically illustration form. If the lysosome does not have the digestive proteins, then the um, material accumulates because it can't be digested and it basically is just staying there in these little storage compartments all in the cell, uh, getting in the way of the rest of the processes of the cell and eventually causing death. And then finally, lactose intolerance, which is a pretty mild um, inborn error of metabolism. It's something that, that is found throughout the world. It's most commonly caused by a decrease in the production of the lactase enzyme as the person grows older. So most people are able to digest lactose, milk sugar, when they are young because it is part of breast milk. And so, you know, babies are designed to live on breast milk. Once in a while, someone will have this lactase deficiency present at birth. Um, and then, of course, there would be a much more severe situation because they could not have milk. But for most, in most cases, for most people, if they are lactose intolerant, this is something that has come on as they have aged. Basically, their body has shut down to making lactase. It is, um, as I said, it's found around the world. is actually more common than what people who drink milk experience, which is lactase persistence. It sticks around in many of us, including me. I do a lot with dairy products. And as a result, if someone is lactose intolerant or lack, they, without lactase to digest things, the lactose remains undigested, and so it gets to be fermented by the various microorganisms that live in their large, person's large intestine. And so they are fermenting it, and gas is being produced as one of the waste products, and it is that gas and the, um, the rent retention of water because the, the lactose stays in the gut and uh, adds to the fecal matter. It increases the solute composition. So osmotic pressure brings water into the large intestine or keeps the water in the large intestine. It doesn't get absorbed out. And so that leads to watery stools and you know all the discomfort of, of that plus the gas accumulation, which is associated with someone being lactose intolerant. Foods that are partially digested, so we've got some yogurt in this picture right here, and certain cheeses may be tolerated by somebody who is lactose intolerant because there's not much lactose in them. Or there are also a, numer a number of products that are just over the counter that can be added to foods or taken at the same time as eating dairy foods 
so that somebody can still enjoy dairy foods even if they are lactose intolerant. Lactose intolerant is different than a milk allergy. If you are allergic to something in the milk, if you're allergic to the protein in the milk, or if you're allergic to the lactose itself, that is an entirely different metabolic reaction. That's an immune system response. Whereas in the lactose intolerance here, we're talking specifically of something missing in your digestive system, in your pancreatic enzymes. Then moving on to malformations, things that are structurally wrong. Usually malformations result in some type of obstruction of the gastrointestinal tract. And they often show up very soon with feeding difficulties or dissension, this, you know, puffing out of the uh, person's abdomen or vomiting because there's something blocking the food, can't go through the um, gastrointestinal tract. So there'd be very obvious signs very, very early on in a person's life. Generally, surgical repair is needed. Some of these malformations are easy to repair. Some of them are more difficult. And often when there is a problem in the GI tract, there are other things going on with the person. There are other congenital abnormalities that are showing up in other organ systems. So generally they come as part of a package of some other things. This, this person has got several faulty genes that are involved in, um, or at least a, or a faulty gene that has um, a number of places where it is having action on the, the health of the individual. The first one I want to talk about is pyloric stenosis, which is a narrowing of the stomach into the small intestine. So here, you remember, you've got your pyloric sphincter, and if the muscles, for some reason, have grown larger than they should be, hypertrophy, then the hole for food to go from the stomach into the duodenum is not large enough. And the clear sign of this is projectile vomiting, which is a picture that I have here. This is not just some baby spitting up, but this is, uh, you know, like a fire hose being turned on, and it may go two meters, six feet out from the child. Uh, sometimes children can get enough food through the pyloric sphincter to kind of eke along, and, um, you know, this, this child looks pretty plump, so actually he's looking better shape than some pictures you can find. But a much more serious problem would be suffering a child suffering dehydration and even to the point of starving because they're not able to get enough food out of their stomach into their intestine. And if it doesn't get to the intestine, the nutrients can't be absorbed. If somebody is starving as an infant, you've got long-term neurological effects that are going to happen because the brain is very busily developing those first two years. And if there's not enough nutrients to supply for brain growth and development, then you're not going to have the intellectual capacity that the person was designed to have. The pyloric stenosis might be mild enough that it will resolve over time, but often children have surgery to remove some of that excess muscle so that the space is open larger so that food can pass into the small intestine. So as I said, this is not the normal spitting up that most babies do. Uh, some babies just seem to be little pigs. Um, I had one that, that ate an awful lot, and he always would just kind of overflow after he was done. But um, this is projectile vomiting, which can, you know, as I said, go several feet away from the child. Esophageal atresia is another fairly common malformation, as malformations go. And in this case, an atresia is when something doesn't form all the way, so the esophagus fails to form. Often it's connected to a fistula, an attachment, a hole between two organs that are not supposed to be attached, and this one would be to the, between the trachea and the esophagus, so that, of course, this is something that's going to have to be repaired by surgery. It's not going to resolve on its own. So I've got several diagrams at the bottom. You know, here's your normal anatomy where you've got your esophagus just all attached and sliding down there behind the trachea, not running into the trachea. Then if someone just has atresia, you've just got the incomplete development. We've got just basically a missing connection that didn't happen when the esophagus was made. Or in this case, we have just a fistula, so there's just a connection between the trachea and the esophagus, which is not supposed to be there. And then the third case, we have both the atresia and the fistula, so that, that both um, connection that was not supposed to be there and no connection of two parts that were supposed to be connected happened. <laughs> and then finally, malrotation, which mal, of course, means bad or wrong, and rotation. 
um, is talking about how the intestines have to position themselves. Basically, as a person is developing in utero, the intestines start out as a very short tube, and as it grows and lengthens, it actually kind of sneaks out into the umbilical cord for part of the time, and then comes back in and twists around and gets all tied together by the peritoneal membrane, that serous membrane. And things can go wrong. Intestines may not twist in the right place, or they may twist too much. They may not get fixed in place, so that these these are things that um, are part of this malrotation. Something goes wrong with the rotation. Typically, you can have bands of tissues known as LADS bands that can go across the duodenum, or you can have the intestine doubling back and maybe even twisting over on itself, ca causing something called a volvulus. So we've got a diagram here over on the side, and I think you've probably seen enough pictures of a normal digestive system to realize that this whole mass of small intestine really was supposed to be positioned more this way, and the large intestine is supposed to be, the transverse section is supposed to be here in front of the stomach, not running behind, and so there obviously has been some malformation of this intestine. It may be possible that there's no doubling back, there's no vavulus happening, and somebody can go along just fine with this misarrangement of their intestinal system. And people do. They may not be diagnosed unless they you know, end up having some kind of crisis. But um, if there is an obstruction, then you would have to undergo emergency surgery to deal with the twisting to perhaps separate parts of the intestine, maybe cut out a part that had died off and reattach something else. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of moving around as an embryo is developing. Uh, body parts don't always develop where they end up. Things have to lengthen and change, and it's actually kind of interesting how it all goes together. And the third topic in this section are autoimmune disorders, and I just want to touch on two. The first one I want to talk about is celiac disease, also known as celiac sprue or a gluten allergy. This is a disease when the ingestion of gluten triggers an immune response that goes so far to actually damage the villi in the small intestine. So we've got a picture of what your normal villi are supposed to look like, those long fingers that are sticking up out of your intestinal, uh, the inner mucous membrane, and you can see in celiac disease how they all really have been destroyed, and you've lost that large amount of surface area for absorption that is possible under the, in a normal condition. The, this particular um, tr disease must, a person who has celiac disease must be very careful to avoid gluten. Uh, even some crumbs from the bread at the table can actually trigger inflammation and a response in the small intestine and damage more villi. So in order to hang on to the absorptive powers of their body, they need to you know, be very, very careful. Since this is an autoimmune disorder, it can come up the first time someone has gluten, or it may come up later in life. And so this is uh, not always easy to diagnose. It can be difficult to figure out. And also because one autoimmune uh, system disorder tends to encourage the body to have others, um, often someone who has celiac disease is also going to be fighting other autoimmune disorders such as multiple sclerosis or perhaps diabetes um, at the same time. So in this case, this is what a true gluten allergy does. Gluten-free food is a, the latest fad right now, um, and you know there's a lot of promotion on how we all should be eating gluten-free. I don't think that's justified, but for somebody with celiac disease, it's very true. They need to avoid gluten and read labels and be very, very careful about eating. And then the second autoimmune disease I want to talk about is Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, which is sometimes abbreviated IBD. And in this case, there is a con chronic inflammation of the lining of the digestive tract, which then over time could lead to obstructions in the digestive tract or ulcers forming or fistulas, connections being made between two parts that are not supposed to be connected. The symptoms of Crohn's disease involve, you know, obviously since it involves the digestive system, you have basic pain in the abdomen, diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, malnutrition because things are not being absorbed because the intestine is inflamed. And what makes it tricky is that different parts of the digestive system can be irritated in different people. So Crohn's disease might be more involved in the small intestine in one person and more in the large intestine with another person. The cause is not known 
It might be an overreaction to a virus or bacterial infection. So someone may have a genetic predisposition to if they get a particular virus or bacteria exposed, then their immune system goes into red alert and kind of as an um, you know, unfortunate side effect, attack the own, their own intestinal system. Often this is treated by cortical steroids, which are anti-inflammatory because you want to get rid of that chronic state of inflammation. So we'll get to another disease later on where there is inflammation, but there is not this um, destroying of the tissues inside the, the uh, intestinal system, and it's not quite a, such a severe situation. But Crohn's disease can be um, quite difficult to treat. It tends to come up in young people, uh, typically between ages 15 and 35. And so, uh, you know, it's something that, that a person has to learn how to live with and manage for the rest of their life. And then I just want to end by talking about a few things, a few dietary or, or digestive system disorders that are pretty closely linked to some lifestyle choices. So personal choices in the area of diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol consumption, stress management can impact on the development of digestive disorders. I'm not going to talk about cirrhosis of the liver, but I think you know that has to do with alcohol consumption. Um, stress is not involved with peptic ulcers, but there are some other diseases that are not helped by somebody living in sort of a high stress environment or you know themselves sort of feeling under stress all the time. So, but I'm going to talk primarily about things related to diet. Obesity, we've been mentioning um, off and on throughout this course on how it increases the risk of a number of diseases, and it is true for your digestive system as well. So someone who is obese is at increased risk for type 2 diabetes. That's when the insulin receptors on the cell do not seem to respond to the presence of insulin. They also have an increased risk of GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, where the contents of the stomach are is is frequently backing up into the esophagus, causing heartburn and uh, inflammation and injury to the cells in the esophagus, along that line the esophagus. Gallstones are more common among people who are obese. Irritable bowel disorder, this is another inflammatory bowel disease, but it is, does not have a long-term effect on the condition of the lining of the intestine. So unlike Crohn's disease, this one you see some of the same symptoms, but you don't have the long-term effects that can lead to obstruction or fistula. You just are experiencing the diarrhea and the um, abdominal pain and gas and such in a more short-term um, situation. Fatty liver disease, where fatty tissue is building up in the liver and interfering with liver function pancreatitis, where there is an inflammation in the pancreas, and then a number of cancers have been linked to obesity of, of being one of the risk factors for that. This little diagram mentions those particular diseases and the ones we've talked about before, things involving heart disease and hypertension, um, you know, pulmonary diseases. We've talked about some of these as we've gone along. So really, obesity, if, if you are overweight, it's, you know, the first thing you can do to improve your health is to try to get that weight off. The next one I want to talk about is a low fiber diet, choosing, and by diet here I'm talking about your eating habits in general, but dietary fiber refers to complex carbohydrates that we cannot digest. They are found in both soluble and insoluble forms, so soluble forms can move into the bloodstream and there are, they, their role there seems to be to moderate blood sugar levels, so de therefore decreasing the risk of type 2 diabetes, and may also reduce blood cholesterol and blood lipoprotein levels, which would then impact the risk of heart disease. The insoluble forms of fiber remain in the large intestine in the colon and increase the water content there, again, by osmotic pressure, keeping water in. And this can prevent constipation and diverticulitis, which I'll get to on the next slide. Constipation, in turn, can lead to hemorrhoids. So constipation, is, as you know, means you've got hard stools. They don't want to move out of the body very easily. It can, requires a lot of straining and, and contracting of the abdominal muscles in order to defecate in a bowel movement. And because of that, at the same time, as this picture shows over here, you can affect the veins that are in the rectum and the anal area and cause enlarged varicose veins, which are known as hemorrhoids, because of constipation, because of the stress and strain of pushing hard material through this part of the body, then it can impact on the um, circulatory health. 
<clears throat> pregnancy also tends to produce hemorrhoids, and um, that's in part related to the fact that the digestive system slows down altogether when you are, are pregnant. Um, certainly in the later stages of pregnancy, it's very squashed and having to move around the baby. But even from the very beginning, the digestive system, the peristalsis, um, slows down with pregnancy probably so that every last nutrient can be absorbed. Because of that, it makes it more challenging not to end up with uh, harder stools than normal. It's more challenging to avoid constipation when you are pregnant. And so between the weight of the fetus pressing down on that part of the body and just the slowness of the digestive system, women often get first introduced to hemorrhoids when they become pregnant. It is possible to remove hemorrhoids if they have become too problematic. Um, an interesting method is to put a little rubber band around them because they're just, you know, a pouching out of a blood vessel. And so that the doctor, we'll just draw a little picture here. So if you have a hemorrhoid kind of pouching out like this, so you've got a vein that has moved in and out, and this is just like a varicose vein. Doctors can put a small rubber band around the top to constrict that, and then this part will die off and um, dissolve away, and your body will reseal itself. So if they are bad enough, there can be treatment. But many people can live with sort of a hemorrhoid or two and not really have any problem, especially if they don't eat a low-fiber diet, if they do eat lots of insoluble fiber, complex carbohydrates found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains keeps the stool soft, and any hemorrhoids you have would not get any worse. Diverticular disease is, caused, or is, the, is diagnosed by the presence of small pockets in the wall of the large intestine, so that the large intestine, as we see down here, is being pushed out. And again, constipation and straining during defecation may be what causes these particular little pockets of, of stretched out intestine. You can see over here, this is a colonoscopy, so the person's gut has been well cleaned out in preparation for the little camera being sent in there. And you can actually see these little pouches here very clearly. Um, you got a little, you know, somebody's taken their fingers and gone along and just pushed out the wall a little bit. So in diverticular disease, because your large intestine is home to many bacteria, um, if, if things are not passing through regularly, then you can have bacterial colonization happen in those little pockets, leading to infection, which then leads to inflammation and even having bleeding in the stool. So that the uh, way to treat this is to use a high-fiber diet, high-fiber diet, especially the insoluble forms, to keep the stool soft, to keep things moving through the large intestine. But in the worst case scenario, if a person experiences abscesses or pockets of infection or fistulas forming or perhaps obstructions, if some, um, if they're still suffering from constipation, a little bit of dried fecal material might get stuck right here and, you know, cut off that small part of the um, bowel or perforations coming right through the, so that the the contents of the intestine actually leak into the peritoneal cavity. These are all situations where surgery might need to step in to, to save someone's life. And then finally, I just want to mention eating disorders. This is not really a situation involved with the digestive system. It's not a disorder of the digestive system. It's a disturbance in eating behavior and weight regulation that is all too common. There are three main types of eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, a person will see themselves as overweight even when they are extremely underweight. And so in all of these situations, what the person, you know, how the person views themselves, what they see when they look at themselves is not what the rest of us see when we look at themselves. And typically a person has, you know, the feeling that their body is just not right, they need to make changes. So here we have just, this is an a advertisement from a um, National Eating Disorder Society, and so it's showing that the woman on the left, this is what the reality is, she's very underweight, but when she looks in the mirror, what she sees is somebody who needs to lose weight, someone who perhaps is you know, carrying more pounds certainly than she has. That Personally, to me, the person on the right looks pretty normal, but, but the idea here is that she does not see herself the way she really is. So anorexia nervosa, someone sees themselves as being overweight even when they are extremely underweight. Someone who has bulimia nervosa, in this case, uh, people experience episodes of binge eating followed by purging, and so there's sort of an out-of-control eating time, and then get, you have to get rid of those calories any way possible by vomiting, by uh, taking laxatives to purge it by diarrhea, to exercise excessively. Persons who are um, bulimic may look 
more normal weight size they or maybe even slightly overweight um, but it's there's a lot of other things going on it's it's not a healthy weight and then someone who experiences a binge eating disorder does the binging without the purging and so they're out of control food in but they don't do the other side of trying to get it out treatment for eating disorders must involve psychotherapy and a comprehensive approach that does more than just look at food on the plate and exercise patterns because eating disorders can be life-threatening and coming back from eating disorders can take a long time um, I know it's much more common in women, but I actually have known two young men who were anorexic. Um, so it is both men and women experience this. There's a number of um, societies and groups that are out there with information and support and help you find somebody to deal with this if you or someone you know experiences eating, eating disorders. So then leaving behind all the digestive disorders, I just want to finish up as usual with a little comment about the effects of aging. There are changes to the digestive system as you age. Um, they're not as large as some of the other systems that we've seen. People may experience problems with their teeth, so that teeth can be become more sensitive to heat or to cold. You may experience uh, gum disease. Teeth may actually to the point of fall out, especially if you're experiencing the... Um, gum disease. The sense of taste and smell diminish so that eating becomes less pleasurable. That's really a bummer. And so that does make it harder often to, to get older people to eat because it just doesn't taste good anymore. Peristalsis slows, so food does not move through the system quite as fast. Swallowing be, may become more problematic. GERD may develop, even in someone who's never had any problems with any kind of esophageal reflux before. Constipation may become more frequent, as I said, because everything slows down, which can then result in diverticular disease. So we see an increase in the number of people with diverticular disease as they age. And nutrient absorption decreases slightly just as everything kind of ages and breaks down in the intestines. The various accessory organs of your digestive system do age, but typically they don't have a big negative impact. Their, their aging process doesn't have a big in, impact on digestive health. But the other thing that can have a big impact are the various medications that people take as they age, even something as simple as aspirin and ibuprofen for arthritis pain, as I said, can lead to lesions in the stomach lining because the effect that those particular drugs have on the, the stomach so that there can be repercussions on medications in the digestive system um, for that it can be fairly serious with age. So that covers what I want to say in this video. This finishes up the videos for the digestive system.